you had had a long introduction read when you were about to get up and speak, or you were going to how many people? So you, so you, you know the feeling. So going, oh my God, I'm exhausted. <laughs> Listening to this guy, what's he been up to? What is he doing? So we have some, we have an hour together, and an hour together isn't a very long time, but we operate, and when I speak we talk about the kinds of issues that we're here to discuss today, um, we're in some ways operating outside of time. Um, tonight we're going to talk about the idea of living loss, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, the story for me starts many, many years ago. Uh, after a long career, uh, after raising two daughters and things being absolutely younger daughter, um, okay. let me start with the older daughter. An older daughter never had to be told to make her bed, to do her homework, um, to do anything. She was just on her own mission. Uh, she was voted in San Diego's Young Woman Entrepreneur of the Year when she was eight. <laughs> um, she was teaching me, I was nodding, and yes, yes, Jenna. Um, she was on her own path. She was a st shooting star. And her little sister came along and said, well, I'm here to teach you unconditional love. You know, I mean, you really haven't learned how to be a parent at all. And I'm here to teach you how to really be a parent. Um, and she did. She tested every possible limit. Um, she went sideways, upside down, inside out. And just about at the point where my youngest daughter was beginning to pull out of this rebellious tailspin she had tested every limit and every water. Um, and Jenna was on a trip around the world. Jenna had said, Dad, I want to take this glorious trip around the world. I know that the world is bigger than Torrey Pines High School in San Diego and Colorado where she was going to school. And uh, I really want to embrace the larger world. And so Jenna was off on the trip of a lifetime. Can you see? Sorry. No, here? we can't hear you. Okay. Let's let's pause and get this okay. because it'll help the video. This is the pause. <laughs> they say everything starts good starts with a deep breath. So it needs to plug in more. It needs a what? To plug in more. Okay. Do that. How's that? Check check. Still not working. I can talk pretty loud. We can hear you well here. I can hear you. So can you hear me? For the sake of the video, we need it mic'd. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Is it I can hear you fine. Okay. All right. So let's see the microphone on. And put this back. So while all this is going on, um, I'm in a moment of bliss. My youngest daughter has pulled out of her tailspin. Want me to speak out of there? Would that be helpful? My oldest daughter is on the trip of a lifetime. <clears throat> and I'm sitting in that moment that every parent uh, wants to arrive at, a moment of peace. Where you say, oh, take a deep breath. You know it's not over. You know they're going to grow up. You know they're going to come home again. You know there are going to be bumps in the road. Because life is life. But it's that moment of peace where you take a deep breath and you say, we did good. And one week later, my phone rang, and I learned that my oldest daughter, uh, Jenna, had died in India in an accident. The bus she was on had flipped over, and four beautiful young women had died. So the world that had come to peace uh, ended, and my life as I knew it ended. And this was 16 years ago, on March 27th. And I started, I knew immediately, uh, even though I was barely able to function and uh, all the wind had been taken out of my sails, I knew immediately that I would somehow honor Jenna's life and spirit by doing something good in her name. And within a couple of weeks, I had an idea 
and I knew immediately what I wanted to do, and that was to start the Jenna Drug Center. And I did. Now, the Jenna Drug Center, uh, in the beginning, was a matter of counting pencils, because that's about what I could do. And I was busy fighting my way back into life. I would walk into a room like this, and there was no air. I could not socialize with people. I couldn't listen to people talk about their kids, um, the future. The future was lost, as far as I was concerned. All the goodness had been sucked out of life. And I had no idea how I was going to get to the next moment. I was a very strong individual, but uh, having your heart ripped out uh, tends to negate all the coping mechanisms that we learn. And I had my heart ripped out. And my daughter, my daughters are both the light of my life, and my oldest <coughs> daughter has been taken. I was enraged with God, um, and that was, that was an interesting journey. Um, how could God have allowed this to happen? I thought I had a deal. I thought if I was a good guy and did all these wonderful things, nothing could possibly happen. I didn't realize it, but I assumed that life would be fair. So here I was in the dark night of the soul, having suffered a living loss, a death of a child. And the Jenna Drug Center started, and suddenly I realized that I was hardly alone and that resources were desperately needed in our community to help families who had also suffered the death of a child. But in that first year, something very unusual began to happen. I started getting calls from parents whose children were still alive. And these parents would say to me, I am suffering. You cannot begin to imagine the magnitude of my suffering. I suffered the death of my child, or the fear of the death of my child, or my loved one every day. The phone can't ring. Uh, I sit in vigilance, in fear, uh, paralyzed in unknowingness, and helplessness, and powerlessness, uh, because I have a child or a loved one who is debilitated, who has disappeared. So calls from people like Beth Holloway, whose daughter Natalie had disappeared in Aruba. Calls from parents whose kids had, were strung out on some drug um, or who were alcoholics and who were sinking fast or free falling. Calls from parents uh, of children who were quadriplegics who had been in horrific accidents, and I began to understand the world of living losses. And I began to develop a respect for what it is that those of us who have living losses need to do to somehow function and survive and live out our lives in a good way. And it became something we started a support group for. So for many years at the Jenna Drug Center, we had a living losses support group. And we had every imaginable kind of living loss, as well as including people who were devastated, who had been betrayed in a marriage and were suffering the living loss of a divorce. But it became clear to me, and if you look at Maria Shriver's uh, website this past month, I actually published an article on living losses. People have been saying, when are you going to start writing about this and talking about it? And finally, uh, Maria Shriver caught wind of what I was doing. And the importance of acknowledging and validating the fact that a loss has and is being suffered, that there is a grief response that is going on continuously with those of us who've suffered living losses or who are suffering living losses. And of course, this includes, and when I met Ashley and Muffy, this includes the families who are affected by bipolar disorder. Profoundly, profoundly. And so tonight's conversation, and I say conversation because I'm not gonna talk at you all night, and because 
we're going to cultivate together a deepening understanding of the living loss of bipolar and how we cope with this loss, our grieving, and how we process, big word, process, much maligned and misunderstood word, how we process our grief, our sense of loss. And that starts with, for me, an identification of what are the living losses, what are the elements of the living loss of bipolar? What do we suffer the loss of? Anybody? Dreams. Okay, let's keep going on this, because you're going to be amazed. What else do we suffer the loss of? Dreams. Passion. Passion. In some cases, our passion dries up. All of our energy is going to what? Leaving very little left over for that elective credit court called living my passion. That passion dries up. That passion area, we don't often have the luxury of remembering even. What was it that I felt passionate about? I'm in survival mode so often and so much of the time that I've forgotten what it was that I loved, what I felt passionate about. So that's another possibility. Yes, please. Dreams. Dreams again. What do we mean by dreams, the loss of dreams? That blueprint we had in our hearts and minds for somebody, for a marriage, for a partner, for a child, for a loved one, the dreams that we had, those blueprints are go where? Those it's a loss. We look at those blueprints and they are going to be unrealized. The more we come out of our denial, the more we come out of our shock and realize that this is a chronic mental illness, a persistent and pervasive condition, the more we are asked to let go of dreams. So we suffer the loss of those dreams because we had beautiful pictures and images in our mind for what could have been and what was to be. Sometimes those dreams are very hard to let go of. And we'll talk about how processing grief, processing grief allows us to let go and embrace what is. And this is the core concept of, of my new book uh, called The Real Rules of Life is really embracing life as it truly is, and how that is the foundational basis for going on, creating meaning again, creating life again. Yes, what else? Uh, stability and self-confidence. Yes, stability. The loss of stability. Control. How many control freaks like me in the room, all right? <laughs> we're the most difficult, because we're so capable and resourceful that we've been given the sense that we can figure out and fix anything, right? Oh, let's just fix this. We can fix this. Right? And we're brought to our knees. Because there is no stability. There is no control. We're faced with our own, many of us for the first time, profound sense of helplessness. And we hate the feeling of helplessness. Matter of fact, many of our identities are bound up in being capable and being the fix-it guy and gal. The type E woman. You know type E? No. Everything to everybody else. <laughs> All right? And the type A man, you know, who can fix and figure out anything. So those of us who are the most resourceful are the most difficult. We hate the feeling of helplessness and powerlessness, and we grieve all the good feelings that come with a sense of stability and control. Yes? Watching your child go into adulthood and thrive like your childhood friends. Yes. So we grieve that picture, that future, that future lost, 
and it's agonizing. I could be walking down, you want to know what my, one of my triggers is? My daughter had the most beautiful hair in the world, beautiful blonde, thick hair. And if I'm walking behind a girl my daughter's age who has thick blonde hair, I'm triggered like that. And what, do I, what am I triggered into? What do I think of immediately? The girl might be walking with a little baby. You start thinking about the career that all of Jenna's friends have gone on to have, and the falling in love, and the marriage, and all the gifts and miracles and blessings of life lost to her. And when you have a child who is debilitated, that future, and you're watching every day, it's not, there's no finality. I buried my daughter at El Camino. And even though she's in my heart and I think of her all the time, I have a sense of finality. I held her body in my arms. I'm not thinking about, will the phone ring? Is Jenna suffering today? You don't have that luxury, many of you. It is the person you love, who you've taken all the way into your heart, suffering today. How do you cope with that? I, I'm hoping to learn from all of you, because we're going to develop some core coping skills. We're going to talk about how we cope and all the ways, because we're all different. There's no cookie cutter here. But we're going to talk about how we cope. It was interesting. I got my PhD in psychology many years ago. And I have not, because I don't function as a psychologist anymore, I'm not reading the, the literature. I'm not reading the journals. I'm not up. So I decided I had taken the last couple of days, I'd go look at what was happening in the whole area of bipolar disorder. What new research? What what have they developed? What protocols for families? And I was amazed that there was so little, if anything, for you as a supportive family member. Excuse me, shouldn't there be a section in your, on your website or in your, and this is why I love the work of the International Bipolar Foundation and what Muffy and Ashley are doing and the volunteers here is truly leading the way. And by having me here and saying, Ken, we need your help. We need to pay even more attention to the families who are suffering and help them develop effective coping styles. Because this is horrific. There's nothing written. There's, there aren't as many resources as they need, there need to be. We need to focus. Because these are people who are grieving every day of their lives. And they need some support and they need some tools. What other losses come with addiction, abusive behavior, financial instability, legal issues, threats of suicide, loss of status? After Jenna died, and I don't mean to be comparing my daughter's death to what you're dealing with, only in the sense of a loss. Uh, it was, I was walking around Del Mar where I live, and I might as well have been wearing a sign on my forehead that said, dead child. That was my new status. Broken family. Child died. Child lost. What fall from status occurs when somebody in your family is bipolar, or when you are bipolar, what is the status risk? What happens to your static? Is that another loss? Yes, sir. Well, isolation. Uh, I'm impressed by isolation. Yes. Loss of yes. The world. Yes. Yeah. Because you or somebody you love is damaged merchandise, and we live in a very don't we culture in a very grief illiterate culture and a very judgmental culture, not that there aren't people who are enormously compassionate, understanding, and empathetic, 
But we live in a culture that wants to, us to believe that there's a fix for every problem, there's a pill for every pain, there's a diversion for every moment of emptiness, okay? uh, there's a whole a healing for every brokenness, and sometimes that's just not the case. It's not that simple. And we struggle. We struggle mm -hmm. finding a path of healing, a path of moving forward. We struggle horribly in confusion, in unknowingness, in not knowing who to trust and who to go to and who we can count on. And every situation is so different. So it calls for our creativity, infinite patience, our persistence, our persistence, our capacity to manage an impossible situation. So, all these losses and more. So, let's talk for a minute about, is there any, anybody else with any other element of loss that constitutes a living loss with bipolar? Or have we pretty much covered it? Yes, yeah, have a loss of hope. Loss of hope. Loss of hope. What does a loss of hope mean? What does it feel like to lose hope? To lose faith? Yes? You know, I'm going to contradict what you're saying. Please. Because if they're alive, there's hope. At some point, you might be able to turn things around and watch them spiraling. But unfortunately, you don't have hope anymore. And that's something that we all now I'm going to contradict what you're saying. I have so much hope. Well, it's exploding out of my heart. It's not hope. hope that my daughter is going to be alive in the way that she was. Right. But I love what you're saying, and I, I want to clarify. When we say the loss of hope, we have to work. One of the things that I'm going to talk about when we talk about how to process these things is paradox. Paradox is a seeming contradiction. We can lose hope and have hope. My daughter can be gone and right here with me and gone forever. We can be broken and shattered and whole and warriors, fierce warriors, as many of you are and as many of you have discovered you are to be able to deal with this. So it's not, we live in an either or world at a time where we need to live in a both and world. We both have lost hope and we have hope. But it's important for us to register on our radar, our emotional radar screens, that I'm feeling hopeless today. That's part of processing things, is getting real with ourselves and saying, part of what's working its way through my system my radar screen, this miraculous system that I have, my emotional system, it's as amazing as my respiratory system, as all the systems of my body and, and mind and spirit. And here I have this emotional system that's telling me it's stirring. Something is stirring on, and it's coming up on the radar screen and I have language I can put to what I'm feeling. Today I'm feeling hopeless. Does that mean I am hopeless? No, I'm feeling hopeless. And the, the irony of allowing ourselves some of these emotions is that that's acknowledging them is the very way to transcend them. As soon as I say, <clears throat> I'm feeling helpless today, as soon as I arrive at the clarity of knowing what I'm feeling and, and, and the self-compassion involved in being honest with myself about what I'm going through. I stop being ashamed of it. I stop trying to hide it, deny it, repress it, avoid it, flip it with positive thinking, reframe it as something else. I own it. This sucks. I feel terrible today. I feel hopeless today. I feel bad today. I feel broken today. I feel like I've run out of energy today. I feel lost today. I feel angry today. I object to what happened. I object to this. Who's the casting director? <laughs> right? We 
We want to ask, who's the casting? Whose idea is this? Who's running the show? How could people be allowed to suffer this way? How could it not be a prior? How come we don't know what to do? It's not like this, is, this happened overnight. How come we still don't know more about what to do to help people who suffer and to help ourselves? So that's what I would, I would just add, that, it, that one of the law, elements of loss is hope. The, the, the Jenna Drug Center slogan of our Families Helping Families program is hope loves company. And that came about after September 11th, and you saw we had a little. I took you to my Facebook page because it's been quite a week. Um, we sat, my beloved and I, uh, started the week in Washington. Uh, we had several talks in Washington and things going on there, and and, uh, and then went to New York, and I had the closing talk at the 9/11 uh, memorial, and then we just got back here. So it's been, it's, it's been quite a week, and I just wanted to share a little bit of that with you. But yeah, and after 9-11, in one of the rooms like this, um, and I was beginning to help out in the very beginning, we had a workshop, an all-day workshop, with every one of these people who had lost somebody, a son, daughter, husband, and wife, in the terrorist attacks. And we're all sitting in a room like this, and we spent the whole day together, and there was tears, and the tears somehow turned to laughter. We were just getting ridiculous. It was, it, I mean, it was, it was genuine humor and laughter, and we knew if we could laugh, we could breathe, and if we could breathe, we could somehow find a way to survive the death, of the incineration. Most of the people in this room had watched as one of their family members had died and literally been incinerated, and so. At the end of the day, when we were just winding down, somebody poked their head in the door, one of the husbands of the women that was in the workshop, and a couple of people said, oh, we wish you had been here today. You know, nothing is different, but everything has changed. We all feel so much lighter in some way. We all feel bonded to each other as a tribe. We all learn so much today. He said, we wish you had been here. And he said, ah, I know how this stuff works. Misery loves company. And a voice came from the back of the room. One of the women in the workshop said, no, sir. Hope loves company. So, but we do end up feeling hope, hopeless, and that is one of the elements of loss. So let's talk a little bit about some of the strategies for coping. Can we do that? And I want your help on every one of these. I'm going to say what I think. I've been talking about processing. But before I get to what it means to emotionally, psychologically process a grief response, that's why we're talking about loss. Because we're approaching your coping as an issue of loss. That's how we're looking at this. Okay. But before we get to that, I would say that number one, coping, is doing exactly what you're doing tonight. You have, we, we are so blessed that we have an extraordinary organization in our backyard, the International Bipolar Foundation. They put on these programs on a regular basis. I get all the announcements. Ashley, you know, I'm on Ashley's list and I get all the announcements. And I'm absolutely blown away. But the first coping strategy is to get informed is to show up, is to be here, is to open your mind and heart, to be in the conversation. This is not what you chose. You did not sign up for this any more than I signed up to be a bereaved parent for the rest of my life. It's not what we signed up for, it's what we got. Okay, And it sucks. And I'm not going to sit up here and put a spin on anything. It sucks. I would much prefer, what's tonight, Thursday night? I would much prefer you be at home watching some stupid, meaningless sitcom or some new show and being in a life of innocence where you don't have to deal with what you're dealing with. Okay? Or being, 
watching the symphony tonight, but being in a life of innocence where your heart is, is not heavy and where you're not having to figure this out. But this is where we are. Here we are. And the next best thing is to immerse yourself in an understanding. <clears throat> you know, denial is a great thing. Without shock and denial, I don't think I would have survived. It's a great thing, but there's a point of diminishing returns. And we all know, raise your hand if you know, somebody who's in abject denial about this, doesn't want to face it, won't come to these meetings, doesn't, is in another world where they can't begin to address this problem that you're, you or your family is facing. So, but denial is a debt that comes due. We don't face into this a little bit at a time and we, we incur a huge debt with interest and we end up paying later on. So your being here and your coming to these meetings and your keep staying connected <laughs> to this wonderful organization, and you're making friends and creating a network of support in this room is critical. That's coping strategy number one. Keep it up and bring somebody with you next time who needs to be here. Tell them you give them $20 and you'll take them out to dinner. Whatever you have to do, bribe them. Tell them that this, this is something that you want their trust to be here because it could be helpful in some small way, right? The second coping strategy is to surround yourself with support, obviously. There are some wonderful professionals, organizations, um, each other. Peer education can never be underestimated. The degree to which you can be a resource to one another is it's fantastic. I don't know, if it, are there any support groups? Okay, how many people in here participate in support groups? Fantastic. Okay, support groups, support, <coughs> critical support. None of us gets through a loss of this degree alone. None of us. And that's where we learn so much from peer support and peer education. Third thing. The idea, what do you learn in support groups? What do you learn in counseling? What do you learn from experts? What do you learn from educational materials? And so on and so forth. We learn to set healthy boundaries. Healthy boundaries. You can't say it enough. This is your life too. How do you set healthy boundaries? What does that look like? Some of us are wimps when it comes to setting healthy boundaries. We're big pleasers, caretakers, rescuers, enablers. That's what the, we learn. That's the way we learn how to love and care. And that's the template that we have, that we need extra help and support breaking out of. What does it mean? And I would ask you to answer this question for yourself. What would it look like for me to take even better care of myself. What would it mean for me to take even better care of myself? What does that look like? Try to form a picture in your mind of at least one thing that you are doing to take better care of yourself. No matter where you figure into this whole conversation, you're somebody struggling with bipolar, whether you're a family member, a spouse, a parent, no matter what. How can you take even better care of yourself? Number four, set healthy expectations. Expectation management 101. What do I expect? In my book, I talk about expectations as set points. Expectations are 90% of everything. What do you expect to happen? If I asked each one of you to tell a story of what happens now, what happens now? Do you have realistic expectations? Are you wishfully thinking? Are your expectations educated and informed? 
because those of us who haven't set our expectations as realistic are setting ourselves up for what? Failure, disappointment, despair, emptiness, okay? Feelings of inadequacy, whatever. So even though we don't have a crystal ball and we can't say exactly what's going to happen, we can set our expectations realistically. Next. No blame or shame. This is a hard one for all of us. We are so judgmental. All of us. We're so judgmental. We want to connect the dots. We want it all to make sense. Even if that means sometimes making a judgment. <coughs> making a judgment about how this happened, why this happened creating blame, creating attributions. You know, I told you earlier how angry I was at God. You know, how did somebody who was furious and ready to spit in the face of the universe because of what happened to my daughter, how did this, how did I find a way to deepen my faith? Wow, how did that happen? My per having permission to object how many of us are told that we have to sit with our hands and legs folded and be good little boys and girls and be good and, and cooperate and be nice and sit at our desks? When sometimes, what do we want to do? We want to scream! All right, now I'm a car screamer. All right, and occasionally, you know, give me a plastic bat on a pillow. But if we don't have constructive outlets for our anger, where does all that stuff go? Where does that objection go? And if we do have a constructive outlet, and I say constructive, that means you don't hurt yourself and you don't hurt anybody else. Okay? Me screaming in the car or going down to the ocean with the waves thrashing and raging into the waves or isn't going to hurt me or anybody else me cutting somebody off on the highway, me displacing anger, me coming home and biting somebody's nose off when they did nothing, or taking it out on the checkout girl at Vons, you know, isn't going to accomplish anything. It just sets yucky stuff in motion. So how, what are my, another question to ask yourself, what are my constructive outlets for anger, for my rage, for my, the part of me that objects, that feels impotent rage about what's happened and what's happening. It just objects. Do I have that? And do I allow myself those outlets? Or do I accept, expect myself to be made of steel? I have steel compartments and I just stuff it in there. And it's not going to eat through the walls of my steel compartments. Right? Sure. Until it does and then we start displacing anger, or then we start getting sick ourselves. So, no blame or shame or judgment. And in place of blame, shame, and judgment, what needs to be there? Okay, key word for the night, self-compassion. Self-compassion is the most powerful and least understood concept in the whole spectrum of living losses and grief responses. Self-compassion is you putting your arms around yourself. It's you being patient with yourself. It's you speaking in kindness to yourself in appreciation for all the things you are doing and have done. It's you speaking in a voice of encouragement. It's you getting tough with yourself when you need to. How many of us need to get a little tougher with ourselves at times? Yeah. It's just not, sometimes we need to be, we need tough love, not from somebody else, we need it from ourselves. 
We need a little bit of that love and self-compassion. Self-compassion is the most transforming element I will talk about tonight. And you strengthening your ability to cope with whatever you're coping with. And some of you might want to share that as we go as in the next section. There's nothing I'm going to talk about renewal and replenishment, self-care. That means rest, exercise, diet, all the elements of self-care. But right along with it is self-compassion. It's the greatest nutrient. Along with self-compassion comes the aspect of humility. Another amazing quality. If I were to grow my sense of humility, my humbleness, you know, so how many of us in here, like me, have been, you feel like you've been on your knees through this or an ordeal? Raise your hand if you feel like, this has brought me to my knees. Okay. And we, we, we want to try to understand. We're, we're a tiny little speck of dust in this huge universe, trying to understand how this can happen, or how we can somehow create a better outcome. And we're on our knees, because we don't know where to begin to coordinate the resources. Our, our prayer isn't strong enough. We don't know how to begin to pray. We don't know how to begin to orchestrate all the resources on behalf of ourselves or our loved one. And we feel so helpless. And we're on our knees in humility. And we realize this is so much bigger than all of us. Humility is the acknowledgment that we don't get to play God. That what's going on is so much bigger than us. And that what creates pain is every time we feel we can control, and we try to control, we have to balance doing what we can, creating the resources we can, taking the steps that we can. But at the end of the day, we have to realize that we can do what we can do, but life has its own terms. We're not going to get to play God. We don't get to predict and control everything that's going to happen. It's all unfolding. So our sense of humility is so important to our ability to cope. Yes? That sense of humility. And saying, you know what? I am on my knees. That's where I am. Part of me lives on my knees. In a, in a moment of surrender, I feel so helpless. And I can hold myself in that. I don't have to be ashamed. I'm not a failure. Back to self-compassion. There's nothing wrong with me. It's not that I'm not trying hard enough or doing enough. Chances are every person in this room, in their own way, is making a heroic effort the chances are that every single one of you, in your own way, is making a heroic effort and deserves to be acknowledged for that. And needs to let your heart just melt with that and receive that. Some of us, I don't know who, some of us are terrible receivers. You know, Lisette has to literally stand me up. She says, all right, I know you don't know how to do this very well, but I'm going to show you. Take a deep breath. I'm going to give you something now. I'm going to give you a hug. Brace yourself to receive it. And I have to, it's counterintuitive. Because I'm, you know, I'm used to being a self-reliant guy. Nobody's going to do anything for me. I've got to do all that stuff for myself, right? You know, so receiving, or what's this going to cost me at the end of the day? 
So it's very, very important to be able to receive both from ourselves and from other people the support, the love, the care that's coming to us. Tonight's about you. It's about your relationship with yourself. It's about upgrading your software to the higher level of self-care. It's the next step in your self-care. It's the next step in your self-compassion, in your appreciation and respect and gratitude towards yourself. Now I know some of you are real hard asses. You're real hard on yourself. You got yourself locked into a torture chamber. You developed a real hardness. You're almost impenetrable. You're almost unforgiving of yourself. You've had to harden yourself to cope with all of this. And I know, so when I say this to you, I say it respectfully. You have done that to survive. And I respect that. But the software upgrade is still necessary. And it might take you a lot longer, and it might be a lot slower and a lot different process for you to take care of yourself, to forgive yourself. Do you know that 90% of the parents, and I've helped over 6,000 parents in the last 15 years that we've had the Gender Drug Center, over 90% of the parents implicate themselves in their child's death. It's my fault. I could have, would have, should have. They're in what I call the torture chamber. Anybody in here know the torture chamber? It's a one-way street to hell. It's living hell. It's the place you go to beat the crap out of yourself. It's the place you go to put yourself on trial and be a nasty prosecutor, that admonishing finger of blame, pointing, convicting, sentencing, with brutality, with no compassion. And some of us get caught up in that, and we think that punishing ourselves is the answer. Depriving ourselves of any joy is the answer. How dare you have joy when somebody in your life is suffering? And I believe that. How dare I go out to dinner? My daughter, my daughter died. How dare I laugh ever again? How dare I go out and have a, a good dinner? How dare I love again? How dare I go on with my life when somebody I love suffers so terribly. So, all of us have challenges. And when we, if you have a torture chamber, you have to stop yourself at the door. There's no redeeming value in the torture chamber, trust me. No therapeutic value. There's no courtroom, there's no justice, there's no nothing in the torture chamber. It's a wasteland. And there, you need to put up a stop sign right outside that door and decide you are not going to go in that door. If you want to do something, if you feel like you need to pay a debt, or you need to make a sacrifice with your life, or you need to do something, to balance out what's happened, then you do something.
But do not, and don't think for a minute, that going into the torture chamber accomplishes a damn thing. It does no good for you. It does no good for your loved one. It does not a damn bit of good for society. It's a wasteland. So if you have spent time in guilt and remorse and whatever form of torture chamber, please make an agreement with yourself right now that you will not go back that it is a wasteland, and you will catch yourself at the front door. You will see that stop sign. You will command yourself to stop. Stop! This is a moment where I need to cultivate compassion and appreciation for myself. I don't need to go in there anymore. So, I want to use the rest of our time, and I'm not sure how much of it we have. How much of it do we have? For your, and I'll stay after as well, because I talk longer than I thought I would. But I, wanna, I want to leave this open to your questions, and then I'll have a closing statement. Your questions, your points of disagreement, your concern, or your wisdom, please share other coping things that you believe have to do with coping. When you think about what helps you the most deal with this, the living loss of bipolar disease, what is it that helps you the most, including your faith? Please. Or a question. Yes. Well, I'm just wondering, I haven't had a loss. And other mental illnesses will cause the same lifelong grieving. Um, and what I was wondering are the people who are suffering with mental illness, do you think they would benefit by reading your book so that they can also give themselves the same freedom of, of guilt and stuff that you're talking about? The feedback that I've gotten in, in this book, I had no idea what would happen, but the feedback that I'm getting from around the world, and we just sold the rights in China, Korea, Portugal, is exactly that. People saying, I have been suffering horribly, and that the lessons of self-compassion, the getting real, the setting expectations realistically, the getting over the life is fair, and that there are deals in life, and feeling, uh, understanding the whole, the whole configuration of what it is, how we paint ourselves into victimhood, and what we can do to help ourselves heal and to manage whatever adversity it is. It's a book about turning adversity into something, into a spiritual and psychological and personal deepening. So, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And by the way, I brought books, somebody, somebody said, hey, why don't you bring books and people want. So I'm, afterwards, I'm gonna be signing some books if people would like to purchase them, and they're $20. They're usually $26, but I figure 20, if anybody's going to do it tonight, you probably, you're more likely to have a $20 bill in your pocket if you'd like to buy a book, or give a book to somebody else. Yes, sir? One situation that uh, my wife has wrote on her board is the effect of a child who has grown up with a parent mm -hmm. that has been bipolar. Yes. And the loss of a lifetime. Yes. Yeah. So how do we how do we speak to and honor and respect a child who's grown up with a bipolar parent? And I, I what I'll say to you is that um, when I finished this book, it became clear to me. I'm not a bipolar parent, but it became clear to me that my youngest daughter. I have an earth daughter and an angel daughter. And my earth daughter has had to live with me for 16 years since her sister was killed. And I dedicated this book to her. And what I said to her at the dedication was, I want to thank you. It's not easy to raise a parent, no less a parent like me. 
we know who raises who. And I want to acknowledge the journey that it has been for you to have to deal with me. Because it can't have been easy. And I want to thank you for all those times you put up with me, you've accepted me, you haven't judged me, you loved me through my deep grief, through my outrage, through my thrashing, through my closing off my heart, through this horrific grief of losing your sister. And I think sometimes that's the way to start. That makes sense? And I think the conversation from there can be one of opening and saying, I'm ready for you to ask me questions. I'm ready to answer them as best I can. I want there to be healing. You know, we, we, don't, we, we didn't sign up for this. When you were a little kid, you didn't sign up for this. This is what you got. And somehow, I don't want this to, I want this to be something that we talk about just as if there were an illness and any other kind of illness in the family. And we just all had to deal with it and live with it. And this is a part of who we are. And we can do it. We can handle that. And there's love that transcends all of it. You had a question? Yes. Did you? Have, yes, please. Well, oh, I've got some ideas right on my head. Um, going back to what you asked earlier, what it helped us through whatever we're dealing with. Um, I lost my son to bipolar disorder um, 16 months ago on 9-11. And um, actually, it was a Yes. But um, no one can understand the way that someone who's been through, just like an alcoholic can understand another alcoholic. Sure. Okay. So there's so many things out there. I mean, my core foundation is fabulous. And I, one of the things I'm, I want to do when I get a little stronger is just help Muffy and he's working with education. Wonderful. And, Educating people about this is an illness, a brain illness. It's because people don't respect it the same way. They think you brought it on yourself or something, rather than if you have cancer. Well, I'm hoping that that by talking about it as a living loss, That's okay. all you have to do is say, try to imagine whether it's you or somebody you know living in a situation like this. You don't know. You don't know what to do. Um, the fear, the humiliation, the confusion, the helplessness is overwhelming. And, and we are at a, in our infancy in terms of understanding that there are resources but you got to custom design every situation. So I think asking people to see it as a kind of loss and grieving the loss of that future, you all said it so beautifully, the loss of the dream, the loss of the future, uh, and the loss of your own sense of normalcy 
and security because this is just what is in your family. And I'm hoping people will find a little more compassion and understanding through that approach as well. Yes, cut two more questions and we'll stop. Yes. Well, I think one other thing that really helps is if you can find professionals out in the field who have experienced this. Yes. Um, you know, just just going through the mechanis mechanisms of, of um, therapy without truly having lived this experience is not helpful. And I know when my child was hospitalized, uh, they wanted to have like a parenting program come to my house, and by that time we had already been to RTCs and everything else. It's like, how old are these people? Do they have children? Have they been through my experience? Yes. I don't want them then, you know? Yeah. So is that something very important? Absolutely, and we, you know, you need to find that there need to be, and you need to be advocates for uh, bipolar literate therapists in this community and know who they are and, and celebrate them. We talk in, in the bereavement community, we talk about grief literate therapists, and unfortunately there aren't a lot of them, but we try to encourage them to come to our support groups, to become interested and curious and specialized in what we need. And we can support, we can reach out to you know, the San Diego Psych Association or you know, any number of organizations and partner with these organizations and draw them in and invite them in. And uh, you know, they, there are talented, wonderful people in the community whose help we need and specialization we need, and we need to let them know. I want to end with uh, just a reading. And by the way, these are my new glasses, which I got today. So I now have glasses. It's been a big week for me. <laughs> but I want to read, this is uh, the last chapter of my book. Early one morning 15 years ago, I drove my daughter Jenna to the airport where she was flying to meet her semester at sea study abroad program. Jenna would be living on a ship and traveling around the world for the next several months. As we walked to the gate, I told her she was about to go on the trip of a lifetime. Daddy, I'm a little scared, she confessed. I've never been this far away from our family and from home. I was one of the few people that Jenna could say this to. To the world, she was a pillar of strength. And I replied, yes, sweetheart, I'm scared too. But this trip is going to be a launching pad for the rest of your life. I can't wait for you to come home and tell us about all the places you've been and the people you've met. Jenna and I tearfully hugged and kissed each other goodnight, goodbye. Minutes later, I watched her flight disappear into the morning sky. I never saw my daughter again. Fast forward 10 years. I'm at the airport with my daughter, Steffi, who's going on a tour of the great cities of Italy. Steffi has struggled horribly since her sister's death, and the trip represents a triumph of courage. It's everything in my power to hold back tears knowing the assurances I had given her sister were empty promises, and my heart is tied in knots. Steffi may be going on the trip of her lifetime, but I cannot say so. I can't even say she's going to come home. All I can do is hope and pray and manage to say, have a great time, sweetheart, and please come home safe. I love you so much. Steffi knew what I was thinking. She gave me a reassuring smile, hugged me extra tight, and reassured me, Daddy, everything's going to be OK. Steffi's plane soon disappeared into the morning sky, and I walked slowly to my car. Closing the door, the tears came. I had sent another precious daughter out to the world, like Jenna. She would be at the mercy of forces beyond my understanding. Fate, luck, gravity, karma, I really didn't care. All I wanted was my daughter to come home. Ten days and three hours later, Steffi's flight landed safely back in San Diego. We cried tears of joy and talked for hours about her many adventures in Italy. That night, as I got into bed and turned on the evening news, I could breathe a sigh of relief. I watched as the wives, husbands, parents, and children 
of men and women leaving for Iraq said goodbye to their beloved husbands, sons, daughters. My heart ached for them, knowing that some of them would not come home. The families of those brave men and women they were sending into the world were at the mercy of life's terms. So I want to again acknowledge Ashley and Muffy and all of you for making the choice to come out tonight to show up to have this important conversation about the grief that we experience and the healing that we have ahead of us and in us to process, to allow ourselves to be human, to <coughs> grieve in hopes that this grief and this allowing of our sorrow allowing of all these emotions will yield spaciousness, will yield strength, will help us summon courage, will inspire us to take even better care of ourselves, will allow us to feel and experience the humility that will help us heal and cope, and finally that will give us the strength that we need to live each day, one day at a time through this and do the very best we can with what we've been given. I want to thank you guys, the Bipolar International Bipolar Foundation for the work they do every day, Muffy and all of you uh, for your courageous journey and thank you for letting me be a part of it tonight. Thank you.